Hello, Povendran. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Could you give an introduction about yourself? Hi, my name is Povendran. I'm from Malaysia and I'm 27 years old right now. Okay. And what do you do? How did you come about the real world? So before the real world, there was Hustlers University. So I joined through Hustlers University in the copywriting campus. And I helped out a lot of businesses in the USA and Europe. Okay. And what were you doing before you joined the real world? Before I joined the real world, I was... um, back in my home country, Malaysia. So I had like a semester break from the German university. So that is during the COVID times. And then the whole country locked out, so I couldn't fly out or come in. And then after a while, I decided to drop out because the visa is getting very expensive. I needed 9,000 per year to maintain my visa. And... um, yeah, so that's why I joined Real World and uh, tried to earn a lot of money. Okay, I see. So you're back in Malaysia now, back from Germany? Yeah. Okay. And how has everything progressed for you within the Real World? Uh, everything, for me, because I needed to learn a lot of things about business, how businesses work, how uh, somebody should have this kind of mindset. I was actually doing very well as a, in academics. So I had to unlearn so many stuff. Uh, one of the stuff is that time, if you just wait it out, all the opportunities will come to you that is completely false in the real world. So how the businesses act is that the more effort you put, the more results you get. It's not about the time. You can wait it out for 10 years, 20 years, you still won't get anything. So it only depends on the speed. Speed, that means the amount of distance that you go through. Okay. <clears throat> so you said you're going to the copywriting campus. What made you choose copywriting? Um, when I was in Germany in my student flat, so there was, I was helping out my fr- a friend of mine. He was a art director, he was studying for art direction. So he came to me asking for ideas. Then I found out what is copywriting. So we just brainstormed a lot of crazy ideas for ads. And then when I came back, I joined the real world. I actually don't know which campus to join, either freelancing or copywriting because I didn't have any capital for the other campuses. So copywriting felt like a natural choice for me. So, and also I could, some people uh, couldn't write like a thousand word essay really well. So for me, everything just flows. So writing is a good choice. So I chose copywriting. Since you say freelancing was a potential option, what kind of skill would you have freelanced? Uh, If I was in freelance, most probably I would uh, delve into web development and the coding side of things. And also a bit of uh, CAD drawing, computer-aided design for 3D printing and all those stuff. Maybe I could, because I had an engineering background, maybe I could even help out in uh, PCB design as well. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, I see. And is that what you were studying in university? Yeah, um, I was in Germany studying for mechatronics for my degree. I see. So how has your average day changed now compared to before you joined the real world? Right now, it's not much of a big change because um, I usually read a lot, write a lot, study a lot. So instead of just studying uh, meaningless things like, you know, like um, that doesn't give you the income right away, I focus all of my studying into copywriting. And when I have the time, I will work out as well. So Mm -hmm. even before the real world, I was losing weight. Then I hit a plateau. So because everybody's like really um, dri- driven and very um, into self-development and one of the first thing that you do is fitness. So I get back into fitness and I managed to lose another 10 kilograms. Before that, I used to be 105. I lost 
uh, maybe 15 kilos. And then during the real world and everything, so I came back, um, pushed further, and I uh, made it to 10 kilograms. So in total, it's like 25 kilograms I lost. And okay. also, yeah, and also I uh, get some uh, monetary wins as well. So I'm converting, converting the calories into dollars. Mm -hmm. That's well put. And in terms of monetary wins, how much have you earned? So far, my total wins has been uh, $2,400. Okay, nice. Yeah. <clears throat> and how did you acquire clients for copywriting? So before this, I was trying on all platforms like email, Instagram, Facebook, messaging, everything. So, but what I did is to stuck to one. So I chose cold email. So I went through all the cold email templates that I could uh, think up. And then eventually one of the um, ways stuck. So I'm getting a lot of response from that. So I've just hammered it down sent to as many uh, niches as possible. So I tried to, and I also tried to look for the niches that I could solve a problem. So at that time, I was into fitness. So I went into the fitness niche, but the thing with fitness is that everybody's reaching out to them. And then I was thinking and thinking, and um, I went into the intuitive eating. So I got my first client there. And then also at that time, because I'm working with uh, US-based clients and I'm in Malaysia, so AM over here turns to PM over there. So I had sleep issues. So I also like, okay, why don't I also reach out to coaches who are solving sleeping issues? So I also did that. And I also got my second client over there. And then I just try to like listen to my friends, to my family, what are they complaining about? What are the niches that are, people are, don't want to reach out like a bit taboo-ish. So I also reach out to like relationship and uh, tantric coaches. So I also got another um, coach from that. And from all of this work that I did, I just collect good testimonials. I try to deliver the work before the time I promised. I try to deliver more value than what they offered. And sometimes they... Even though, let's say I'm just writing them maybe five emails or six emails, I try to structure it as well as possible. So all they have to do is just copy and paste and get the uh, get their own wins and they will share it to me happily. Mm -hmm. right. So that's how I go about with the clients. Interesting. So what was the biggest challenge you faced when you were starting out with copywriting? So the biggest challenge I faced... Okay, so it's more like a, a racial thing. Maybe it's on my mind or something else. So the first time I was reaching out, they'll, they, they'll type back like, hey, you're an Indian scammer. And then because of my name and everything, even though all my, uh, there's no typos, there's no grammatical issues, everything is good. I'm just offering like free samples to them. I'll still get that. Um, maybe I get that remarks. And also, uh, so I just try to like, pitch in a different way. So when I found that different way, um, maybe talk to them in the, uh, American slang a bit. So not uh, not so general. I'm trying to like make it narrow. I'll, um, what the biggest change I've made is I changed the local language to UK to US. So I don't know why, but I started to hit more uh, response from that. And then I'm trying to incorporate more language the way that they talk. And then I'm getting more and more response from that. And then eventually some some guy will love my had love my copy. Uh, once they say yes, everything I deliver, and then they will very happily join on my call. Mm -hmm. So in during my calls, I always get almost 95% uh, close rate because they already love my work and they just want to look at me, see whether I'm a real guy or not. All right. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> so in terms of what you learned from the real world, mm. how different have the resources been and all the lessons, everything compared to what you could have found on the internet? 
okay maybe if you dig hard enough you might get all of the resources in the real world if you dig if, if you take like one whole year to go through all the youtube content you might get it but the best part about the real world everything is structured and the professors uh, they made money from doing that thing they're not selling a course about that thing so usually one red flag about scamming is that people sell courses on how to make money and that's how they get rich not they made money and then they sell, sell a course another way so in the copywriting campus the professor actually made real money from doing copywriting and then he's teaching the way to do it so when you hear whatever he says maybe you already have uh, knew about it okay maybe during the sales call you have to build rapport or uh, not pitch right away or say these things maybe you already know it so when you hear from him it already solidify yes i mean the right way i'm doing this so this i have to do it so it's just easy you just go learn do all the practice if they ask you to do 3 you do 5 if you do 5 try to make it 6 and also the best part of about it is that you get review right away from other students so maybe in malaysia the way i speak english might not be as good as the whole world maybe in in your own country um you you might talk english you might be the best english speaker in your class but throughout the whole world there's a standard so my standard was actually below so when i started to get lot of reviews and all the stuff because in school my english language is always like 90 and 100 ish so when i get uh when i get remarks from the review like hey your english is not that good you're not um saying the stuff right way, right away so i it will feel like people are hurting you but they're actually giving you constructive feedback so you just swallow your pride at that moment and then you work on your english and once you learn the english just learn the copywriting flow there's a lot of flow based on human psychology so the best part about the copywriting is that you're not only learning on the computer and only doing it the job you could take it you could take the skill and put in some other way you could use your copywriting skills to persuade people to talk better to make better speeches and at that time i was also um attending toastmaster so it's like a public speaking club so once i make my speeches everybody will listen because i'm just using the copywriting flow of the speeches and everything so people will hold their attention to me and uh, um listen to my speeches and usually the compliments i get is that wow your words is so good the way you deliver is so good but the thing is i just write it the copywriting way so you could use the same thing and even you could use it for dating so my text game has been lot it's it's like uh, very 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 good so until the girls are saying that hey are you copy pasting from uh, pick up line from the internet i say no it's all me it's just flowing everything so once they meet me and then they're like mind blown how well i could speak how well i could say stuff so copywriting is very good in that regard so i bet all the other campuses also the knowledge bleeds into the real world outside of work outside of um making money it also gives you the fitness benefits as well and copywriting is based on persuasion so i'm i could persuade myself to do the stuff that's very hard for me mm-hmm. <clears throat> interesting and yeah for sure you're correct and that i don't copywriting for a few months as well and if you're mm-hmm. consistently doing it every single day eventually it does start as you say start bleeding into your other aspects of life as well yeah so and it's in a positive way as well because uh yeah <clears throat> Yeah, it I teaches think... you human psychology, but again, in a positive way, not a negative way, and just how yeah. to write better, which is it correlates to speaking as well. If you can write better, you'll speak better. So yeah, exactly, uh, you put it well. And what were you going to yeah, say? Yeah, totally agree. 
Yeah, so um, no, it, it's all right. I just, uh, my t- train of thought just left. Okay, yeah. So you spoke about the community within the real world, reviewing your copy, helping you in that way. Yeah. Has there been any other aspect of the community or winch channel that you can speak about that has had an impact on you? Mm, my biggest motivator in the real world has been the morning power-ups uh, calls and also the winds channel. So sometimes you feel like it's like, you know, when you're in the grind, you feel monotonous and you lose your steam. So what I will do is like go through the winds. I'll just look like through all the winds. Some guy will get like crazy amounts of money, like 30,000, 40,000. And you look like, I just got like 1,000. So it, 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 it tells you that there's more to be earned, there's more to learn and uh, more things to do. But when you see those numbers, like 30,000, 40,000, and you are getting like two or three K here and there, you actually learn that it's about responsibility. The more responsibility you take into that business, the more money you'll get. So it's not about the way that you talk in the sales call and then you like cheat them out of tens of thousands. First, you have to provide the um, results that you're promising and you over deliver on them. And then you take on more and more responsibilities. So if you start your copywriting, for example, email copywriting, you'll write emails first. And then what they have to do is copy and paste. So when the time goes right now, I'm uh, handling two email newsletters. So they will ask you, hey, you know all of this, Um, You know how to segment, you know how to use all these tags in the email software. Why don't you do, you do it for me? And then I'll just say, okay, sure, I'll do that. Um, This is going to charge extra because I'm taking more of your work. I'm taking the risk, but I'll make sure I deliver on what I'm saying. So what I do is I make sure everything is good. And also I offer extra hey, and then Maybe every week, I usually give them a report. Hey, these are your open rates. These are your click-through rates. This is how much revenue you have earned. Give them a report back. So you have to be even more hardworking than the business owner. So if you take care of all of their marketing side, the only thing they have to do is the product fulfillment. If they're doing coaching, they focus everything on that of their own client. So they get to do their job better and you get to do your job better. And then when you, both of you guys do your job better, revenue just flows in easily. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All right. Okay. I like that. <clears throat> now I'm wondering, is there any more of an impact in your personal life that the real world has had on you that you could speak? about? Yeah. So at first I was, um, reaching out to clients and then I reached out to a local client. So she's an occupational therapist, but the thing is she's just starting out. So I thought like, okay, why don't I just test out the marketing skills with her? And then it came, uh, she got a lot of good results. What she actually wanted is to be an authority figure um, in the country. She doesn't care about so much of the monetary aspect. So, after I made her Instagram profile in such a way, it uh, boosts her authority. She managed to get a good position in the Malaysian Board of Occupational Therapists. So that's a win for me. So I took that testimonial and reached out to a lot of people. So then after that, I got a real US uh, client to help her in her product launch. So I helped her out. I made like really good emails because she liked to give a very long stories about how she overcomes things and everything. So in email, people just love to read one or two minutes and then go about their day because email is more like mail. You don't, you're not going to get love letters in the mail. You're not going to get like uh, fr- letters from friends. Most likely you're going to get bills. You're going to get uh, warning letters. You're going to um, get scams. So people are very wary about the email. It has like a very negative tone. So what I did, I made it very cheerful. It's like a friend who's reaching out to you. So when people 
are happy, they will read the email and we will be waiting for that email. So I managed to get that and then that first win was like $600 and it was life changing. Suddenly I got like 2000 ringgit. So 2000 ringgit is like the basic salary. So if I continued my mechatronics, I get up from university, I come back to Malaysia, I will get 2000. I got 2000 just from writing a few emails. So at that day, um, before that, I was having a bit of problem because Malaysian government, their, their monetary systems are quite awkward. So she was sending in wire to Malaysia and it bounced back. So I thought she actually cancelled the payment. I thought she was scamming me. So when I talk about, hey, hey, the money didn't receive, it bounced back because I already gave her everything that she needed. So it bounced back and she sent it to another way. Then I learned about Stripe. So Stripe, you have to wait for two weeks. So when that happened and also while paying for the real world, my all of the Malaysian banks, they blocked it. You can't pay the fees for the real world. So what I did is from that client, she taught me to use Stripe. So I use Stripe um, and get wise account. So everything is... Um, international and online mm -hmm. so i was waiting so you you already build up a, about the fear like oh am i gonna get the money or is it gonna bounce back is it like a scam is she scamming me because this is nothing to do with the video, real world it's just like the money issue you'll get anxious a bit so what happened is once i got the money i took out everything and then uh, put it in my room so i was really excited like okay now i can see the real cash this is like the real thing that i got so it's like your very first win so i was like really happy and i was thinking about the ways to invest it and all the stuff so i went to sleep so after around three o'clock somebody knocked on the door i thought it was my father his uh i thought he was he was drunk or coming to the wrong room or whatever but it was actually the robber. So I was home invaded that time. So they opened up everything. They took away all the shirt. They put it on the floor. They were trying to find something to rob. So they were asking me for gold. They tied up my mom. They tied up my dad. My sister was there. So I was really, really... And also there was like a knife on my neck. I could really, really smell the machine oil. They sharpened the knife. I could smell it. I could, I could feel the sharp edge on my neck. But because I, I was trying to like fight them, but the thing is they have six, six of them, I think five of them in the house. One with, uh, with my mother, a few with my dad and the sister. So they're all are rummaging about. So I'm trying to like think of ways how to do this heroic stunt to like punch this fellow, go and run and do all the stupid stuff. But what happened is that uh, my sister cried and my mother rushed in to help her, to like block her, to make her safe. They took my mom and like they they roughened her up. She, they, they like kicked her and then they slapped her. So I, I, we all just like listened to what they said. So what, they, what happened is that they took all of my, they were trying to find jewelry and I'm not like a flashy guy. I don't have gold or anything. So they took away my action camera. But th these guys are really professional. They were talking amongst themselves to not take the laptop, not take the phones or anything because it's traceable. So they took away the, uh, the, the money that I just got from, the, from working hard. And then they got my action camera and then they even stole my cheap Casio watch. And then... Um, because we don't have gold in the house, they were like really upset about it. So they trashed the whole place. And we, we even have a dock, but the thing is, we locked the dock outside. So it cannot come in to do anything. And it also didn't know that people are inside because the house is quite soundproof. So they came in from the kitchen area, climbed up and uh, came up here. So the whole place was trashed. So I was like... It, it was one of my most embarrassing and the lowest time of my life. So what I did is that I, I was keep on hearing this message. If anything happened, you have to work. If you, I, I cannot go and find these guys and seek revenge or kill them or do something crazy. I don't have that means. So the best way to do that is to work hard and to get back the 
money from it. And it was actually a very big motivational factor for me. So right after that happened, I joined a Muay Thai gym. I trained every day. I took it very seriously. And I just play back that scene in my mind. So whenever I need to need to be very motivated, I play back that scene. So I need to like protect my family. I need to like provide security to them. I need to like uh, bring them to a better, safer spot. So whatever I learned from the real one and whatever Andrew Tate says about the real life is all true. Whether you agree it or not, one day you'll experience it first hand and you will completely agree what he says. Maybe about the real world, I 100% agree on what he says. Maybe under some nuances, I'm not old enough to know that I haven't been in many life experiences, so I don't know about it. I'm just grey about it. But the thing is, um, fitness is number one priority. And um, I was doing bodybuilding back then, so I look big and intimidating. But once I started fighting, I'm the slowest guy over there. Everybody could just punch quite quite uh, quickly and I, I can see the punches coming, but my hand is just not moving. They have that snap. So I don't have that snap. So I just train and train and train that. And then that gives like a very good, a very good motivation for me and very good inspiration. So whenever I get like people rejecting me, oh, uh, fuck off, you scammer or like, stop bothering about me. Even though you took like 100 emails and like typed it out and just click and send, it's just like clicking a video game. You just click and send, nothing happened to you. They're not going to come and do anything to you. But getting punched in the face is a real threat. So that's what I learned. And right now I'm still moving on. And it's like a blessing from God. I take it as a blessing from God because I needed a good motivation to like push me to the end. So I focus on getting money and um, focusing on my health, focusing on security, focusing on my fitness, and also helping other people. Because the way that you get rich is that you provide value. So in this exchange between my clients and me, I'm actually losing out money because I'm giving them extra and they're only paying it through the money. So it's more like um, the forces. If you're an engineer, you'll know this. So it's like more like friction and the forces. So the only way that you move is to overcome the friction. So the way to overcome friction is actually give more force than necessary. If you give the same force, you'll be there. So if you give more, then you'll move. So the same thing. So whatever you do, you just try to give. Be more generous. This like this business stuff is the best way that you can be a nice guy because nice guys are, you know, they love to give and give and give and give. And in the, maybe you do for other people that not deserving, they will like push you down. But for this, you can keep on giving. Even you get rejected, it's just practice. In the end, this guy said this, this guy said that. So when someone said yes, you'll be very happy. And you'll also try to make them feel happy and also do whatever you promise. So that's what I learned from the real world. Wow. I'll go back to that story about house robbery. That was insane. That's like a horror movie scene from a movie. Yeah, exactly. Uh, do you have any idea for what their motive was? Or do you think it was so just random that they chose your house? It, it was more like professional opportunities, opportunistic crime. So I think they are like looking out for the rich houses and then they targeted mine. And then the way they do it is like super professionals. They had like everything covered, their faces covered, mm -hmm. their legs covered. They was wearing everything white, all long sleeve. I can't see their faces. They barely talk. So I don't know. So even I can't identify them. Um, I actually, after they robbed my money and ran away, I didn't care about them one bit at all. Even the, I think I needed to go to the police station to give a statement. I just said like, if they needed a statement, they can come to the house and ask for the statement. So until now, 
maybe my mom and dad already give that statement. I didn't have to do any statement. I was so furious about losing my money. I was so furious about my own security and my family's security that I just brush away the things on the ground and it just started working, started to prospect, started to go about the thing. So it was a lot of stress in me. So I just like keep quiet, do whatever I need to do. And then in the evening, I'll go to the, my Muay Thai classes and then I will uh, learn my Muay Thai and stuff. Wow. <clears throat> and why initially did the Malaysian banks block your account? Mm, they didn't block my account. They just blocked the transaction. Oh, okay. I thought your yeah. account was blocked. That's why you had to take in cash into your home. But that was just the option you chose to see the money. Yeah, in front of you. yeah exactly. So because the I, I was having trouble with the banks and having trouble with the money. So I actually got a bit anxious whether the money is real, whether it's going to come. So I just like, okay, let me touch the money. So that day I just like, yeah, withdraw everything. Okay, I see like, okay, this is like real money. Okay. The day, the day after that, I'm just going to put back the money in the cash deposit machine. Before the day even came in the night, this thing happened. Do you think so, they saw you and were drawing it from the bank and then they followed you back? No, I was, I was uh, real careful about it. So oh. I didn't see anybody around me. Even when I was withdrawing the bank, like nobody was standing behind me and stuff. So I think it's more to do with the... Uh, uh, appearance of my house. My house looks a bit grand, uh, renovated, so it looks a bit different. So maybe they came in that way. And also, I actually don't live in the city. I live in quite a suburb place. So it's um, people over here are not so friendly. Even sometimes when I go jogging, this guy will come and tap on my shoulders. Hey, what are you doing? Hey whatever so what i just do like i just look at them stare at them for a while and then they just go away sometimes they just think that um these guys are just trying to like they're just teenagers they don't know what to do so they just go around bullying people so after learning muay thai i already ha had like a few not few like maybe one altercation so this guy was drunk he was like um, calling me out for running in the night. So it was right after Muay Thai, so I didn't finish my 10 kilometer for the day. So I did like two kilometers in the gym. So the remaining eight kilometers, I have to do it, uh, come back and do it. So I was running and running. So these guys just like stopped me and uh, like they were coming by the motorcycle and they were just like tapping me around. So I just stopped look at them so whenever they come back i'll just like mirror their movement is something to do like ring control so they already got scared like okay this guy can actually see us can do something harm they just like go turn back and run away so yeah so i think it's a good experience for me and also i find it like really challenging so when you like try to fight your whole body and your mind is into that game Maybe not like um, music, maybe music, your mind wanders off, your body is there, but this is more like a different kind of meditation. It's like meditation is like if you're trying to go to 0%, this is like 100%. So all your, your, your very concentrated, your body is going hard. And then once you finish, it feels like, okay, I'm really relaxed. I have no urges to be angry about anything. So I get that kind of calm right now. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wow. Okay. Quite a story. Did not expect that. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. So since you said what Tate talks about is true, about there being yeah. violence in the world and you need to be prepared for it, yeah. is there more to go into on what kind of an impact has Andrew Tate had on you? So at that time... I just started my self-improvement journey. So the very first thing I did like to lose weight, I was looking on David Goggins. So 
whatever I do, like, okay, I have to focus on fitness and all those stuff. So it went to a point that, okay, who do I turn to? Who do I turn to for money? So I just looked around and stuff. So at that time, I was also dating. So I found Sterling Cooper. So from Sterling Cooper, I found Tristan. Tristan, I found Andrew. So whatever Andrew said is like, yeah, like at first it's like quite jarring the way he said it, but I feel like, oh, somebody had to say it. Thank God he's like saying it out. So I feel like, yeah, whatever he's saying, yeah, it's true. Because that time I was also uh, knowing that a bit of guys are trying to flirt with girls, like being like girls, like doing their same poses and stuff. They're trying to look pretty as well, like Korean boys. So if you come over here to Asia, you'll see like a lot of Korean boys in uh, cosmetic shops. So it's it's very confusing. Like why is a guy trying to sell a women's product by putting on him? So he looks more pretty than the girls around. So it's a bit confusing for me. But I always been like a guy if I okay if you give me this role I will do this role as best as possible so I stick to this so because I'm born as a man I try to be the best man as possible so so I just listen to what he said okay you need to fight so that time when the when the robbers came in I the only regret I had like why didn't I shut up and go to the fight gym why I still do, did bodybuilding and stuff so I was like thinking of that. So once everything cleared, when even they went out, so I, the first thing I did is that worked and then I joined the gym. So I joined the gym and I, I told to that uh, coach, I think the first two sessions, they were going easy on me. They thought like I'm there for fitness. Then I, then I found out that I need to go and tell them, hey, I'm, I want to fight. So change me to another program. So when they changed me to another program, Compared to Muay Thai and bodybuilding, Muay Thai is more exhaustive. So the very first thing they, the coach asks us to do is to run around the block. So it was around like a two kilometer loop. So you go around the loop and then right after the loop, you skip for 15 minutes. Right after you skip 15 minutes, you'll do burpees and all the conditioning stuff. It depends on the day. So the only time I take rest is during the push-ups because I'm extraordinarily strong at the push-up. I could do like 40 push-ups at once and I, I, I could just rest on the push-ups. So I'll rest on the push-ups and then right after that, there'll be heavy back trading. And then because for me, I came into the fighting stuff, so I need to train with the guys. So mostly Asian guys are quite small, small frame. The fighters all there are small frame. So I have to follow them and they are very, very fast. They're very fast in the training, but I'm like a heavy hitter. Everybody call me Mike Tyson over there. So I have to train. Uh, I, I need to have fast hands and stuff. Right after heavy uh, back, we have to do uh, pads. So when I'm sitting down, wrapping my hand, then that's another place I rest. Then when I wait for my turn for the pads, then I'll go for the pads. So the coach makes sure I get... I get like exhausted and then after that I get to spa. So when I spa, I'm like, I can't think anymore. So these guys, I, I try to go very hard at the beginning and then, you know, these guys, they know the game. They just wait me out to make me tired and then they come and uh, hit me. So mm -hmm. right after that, yeah. And then, and then after that, they would ask me, okay, but these guys are just like ordinary people. They have like a job, even the top fighter over there, he's just a shopkeeper. He has like a normal grocery shop. He just like, you know, does all this stuff. So even I, they were talking about Andrew Tate uh, about it because one of the time I wore this t-shirt. So they were talking like, hey, I, I seen this guy do, he's, he's very good. And I told him like, brother, just join the real world it will be good for you then he just said you know scam 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 i'm not gonna believe it's a scam because 50 dollars might not be a big sum in the us or europe i think a, a, a good way to measure is that the mcdonald's scale i think for 50 dollars you could buy like uh 50 mcdonald's is it a dollar menu 
I don't know. I never had uh, McDonald's order on other parcels. I think it's around one dollar twenty cent or something like that. So you could get like forty Big Macs with fifty dollars. Over here, two hundred and fifty ringgit, you only get like ten Big Macs. It's really expensive. So actually, for us, McDonald's is like a it's a higher tier restaurant. So going out for McDonald's is a perfect date idea. It's a perfect way to treat yourself. So so it's like a big investment. So these guys would rather pay the money on other stuff. And these these guys are broke as well. So a lot of people come to me as scam. Because one thing is because the banks, they're actively trying to stop people from uh, joining the real world. And number two, because they get bounced off and they think that if they don't agree with the guy, you can't learn anything from them. And, and these are the guys who will talk bad about the teachers after class. Oh, these teachers like that. But in the end, they'll go ask, hey, how to do this question? So it doesn't mean if you disagree with the guy or agree with the guy, there's nothing to learn from him. So it's always an opportunity to learn. Whatever happens to you is an opportunity to learn. Yeah. Yep. So for people online who do think the real world could be a, a scam for $50, oh. what advice do you have to them? Number one, think what do you think is a scam. Have you seen a real scam before? If you've seen a real scam, what they'll ask you to do, before this, I even joined like an MLM, you know, uh, what, after like a few years, there's one friend will call you out for a coffee date. Hey, let's go have a coffee. I want to talk to you about an opportunity. So because you didn't see the friend, okay, let's go and see what he, he's, he's talking about. And then he'll pull you in for a business seminar and they'll trap you in a room. They'll let you sit for two hours on a very boring presentation, but how this is going to give you money and stuff. So that's a real scam. But in the end, what they'll ask you to do, they have their own product. They have their own messages. All you need to do is copy paste. You become a bot for them. And then if you don't, and they call it like you are, you are your own boss. You have to do this. You are your own boss. You can work flexible, whatever. But in the end of the week, the guy who signed you up will be scolding you. Hey, you need to do like 100 um, posts for a day. Why are you only doing like 20? Come on, you have to work. You have to work. You need that money, right? You have to do this, right? So it's more like manipulative. But when you come to the real world, everybody's encouraging you. Okay, uh, do this. Okay, you, if you want to do freelancing, this is the way to do freelancing. If you, do, you want to do copywriting, this is the way to do copywriting. If, let's say, you don't want to do it, nobody's going to say anything about you. Maybe some of your peers will say, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. But nobody's coming there to and scold you. That's a form of... Uh, so I think it's like the scam is on you. If you don't do it, it's a scam. You're wasting your money there. Even if... You come there to not learn money, to have friends. It's a beautiful place because everybody wants to succeed in life. Nobody's there like lazy. Yeah, sometimes some guy will like do like stupid stuff and uh, post like stupid links over there and then he'll get banned. But everybody over there is encouraging. Nobody will ever call you retard because you are being this. They'll call you retard and show you the way. That's very beautiful about the real world. Everything's on you. All the resources are there. It's just for you to come and take it. So for me, it's really, really worth it. And I think there's nothing like that, even, even in universities, even if maybe if there's one thing like real world, it will be super duper expensive. There's nothing for $50. It's actually a steal. That's why I tried my level hardest to find a way to pay to get in because not many people over here are getting in. So it's like an unfair advantage. Interesting. Okay. So since you're on this trajectory, where do you see your life heading in the short term, medium term and long term? So in the short term, contrary to what everybody in the real world are doing, they are like trying to get like $10,000 per month and move to Thailand. 
I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to get 10,000 and move to Scandinavia or maybe Northern Africa because I hate the heat here. So I want to actually find a place that snows. More snow, the better. So, I didn't know Northern Africa snows. It's I hot think the, hot, no? yeah, it's hot there as well, but it's not like tropical weather. Oh, so, okay. yeah, over here when you sweat, the sweat stays unless you have to do something about it. And the humidity is real. It feels like a sauna every day. And it also super hot. And the, when I was in Germany, the most beautiful thing about is that is the weather. There will be summer, there will be spring, there will be autumn, there will be winter. Everything's like changing. It's like interesting. Okay, you get to change your, your clothes. You have to change your this. And then every, there's a, like a very new perspective. Over here is just the same thing again and again and again and again. Maybe a good thing about here is the food. But since I could cook very well, if I really wanted to eat, I could just cook and uh, eat it over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, I don't think Malaysia is like the ble bleeding edge of the world. I want to be in the bleeding edge. Even maybe if I want to go to a music concert, I don't have to like, you know, go to Singapore and see Taylor Swift or Rihanna or whatever. If I re uh, really need to go to the music concert, I'll just go over there. Uh, yeah, everything's bleeding edge. Over here, people come here for relaxation, for holidays. I've only seen people here for holidays. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, I see. Well, there's all my questions for you. So to end off, for people who want, who want to find out more about you or contact you, where can they do so? So the very first thing they can do is uh, hit me up on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Indiran of the world. Good. So you can find so me there. I'll add it to the description of the video. Anyone interested, check that. And yeah, that was quite an interview. Uh, some interesting insights from you. So thank you for those. And I look forward to doing a follow-up with you to see how you're doing in future. Yeah, looking forward. Okay. So yeah, I can end there. Thank you. And all the best till next time. Thank you, Rokas.